So I told my staff this morning that um, I'm giving notice tomorrow because for me, Lori Moore is the pinnacle. I'm done, I'm out, mic drop. Reading her novels gave me the feeling for the first time of hearing myself in a book. Somehow her writing manages to be warm, nihilistic, hopeful, devastated, cynical, and loving all at once. It's just like a miracle. And the natural humor threaded through her work, it's, it's really revolutionary. In her short story collections, Self Help, Like Life, Birds of America, and Bark, and her novels, Anagrams, Who Will Run the Frog Hospital, and A Gate at the Stairs, she paved new possibilities for voice that continue to echo in so much fiction today. The same shine and focus is on display in her collection of essays, See What Can Be Done, Essays, Criticism, and Commentary. Topics as diverse as Joan Silber, Sweeney Todd, Clarice Lispector, and Friday Night Lights are given the full Morian treatment. I don't almost, I never quote critics in my introductions, but um, Dwight Garner did say in the New York Times that this new book flooded his veins with pleasure. So I just thought that was so wonderful. We had to include that. So please, um, with pleasure, help me welcome Lori Moore to Politics and Prose. in front or walk <laughs> behind or um, I don't care about the cell phones you can leave them on <laughs> I don't even care whether there's a question mark after your questions I almost I almost just leaned against the fire alarm so we almost had a fire drill so so I'm clearly caught in chaos and must like it somehow I I I came upon a notice for the event tonight that said that I was going to be sharing views of various moments that had shaped our country. <laughs> I thought, what? <laughs> because I thought I was going to read to you about my honeymoon. Hey, how are you? Um, so we can do both. My, my honeymoon was not a momentous moment that shaped our country that I know of. It, you know, who knows? Um, but we can, I can take questions afterward and we can talk. I have one, maybe two, authentically personal essays in this book. That is, they're not reviews of anything. They're not using events to sort of bounce off of uh, in any way. And this one was commissioned by a magazine um, that then killed it. So it's never appeared before anywhere. Um, they, they gave me the kill fee, which I always thought would be a great title for a murder mystery. <laughs> kill fee. Um, and then my, my agent thought it was so depressing <laughs> she didn't want to place it anywhere else. So I took my cue from her and I just stuck it in a drawer. But I pulled it back out later and I thought, I still think this is kind of funny. I don't know, it might not be that funny, but, um, but it's true. So there's that, it has that going for it. Um, it's called, and in honor of Stephen Hawking, it's called One Hot Summer or a Brief History of Time. A bride on her summer honeymoon, what could be more beguiling? Well, a younger bride to begin with, one less destined to wear an off-white suit at the ceremony. And what's with that anyway? The advertising of a lady's past, the beige and ivory taint of autobiography dyed like a scarlet A into the very threads of her dress. Why not say it another way and wear yellow, black, or green? Why not horizontal stripes? Chinese brides wore red, as did Chinese, excuse me, as did Jane Austen's mother, who later cut up her attire for outfits for the kids. Who wouldn't want something bright and cuttable? I'd always had a little trouble with anything called an institution. I was 34 and had been seeing the same man for four consecutive years and living with him for two. 
Not a record for anyone except for him. We spent the spring fretting. Should we get married? He felt we should in this moving through life way. It was what came next, which would in turn, of course, quickly introduce the idea of divorce. <laughs> We're all fiends for narrative plot, narrative plot, rising action. I wondered whether our marrying should really be this notch in the belt of time. Shouldn't it be rather an emotional and spiritual referendum on us? If we needed an event, we could, say, break up. Get married or break up. That's pretty much what it came down to. Love, love went without saying, so we didn't say it. Perhaps we were a little bored. Something we both seem to agree should probably occur. Though looking back, I'm not sure why. It was just motion, momentum. But with the tulips up, the air warming, and then suddenly the tulips down, petalless, bug-like, and leaning, still we remained undecided. We both understood I would not change my name to his, but privately I felt this might not augur well for the success of our union. I suspected quite correctly, I think, now that those women who changed their names to match their husbands understood something about marriage that I was in the dark about. My boyfriend was of the school of thought that marriage, like a house or a car, was a necessary accoutrement of adulthood. I was resistant to that school of thought and wasn't really in any school of thought at all. Not a certified school of thought, not in a matriculated way. <laughs> to quote Daniel Handler's adverbs, I was letting my thoughts run around the yard rather than reporting inside. Or to quote from Richard Yates's The Best of Everything, a familiar little panic gripped her. She couldn't marry him. She hardly even knew him. Sometimes it occurred to her differently that she couldn't marry him because she knew him too well. And either way, it left her badly shaken. Summer was approaching, so all right, we would at least begin the process. Otherwise, I hardly needed reminding. I was risking the possibility of a life where in the in-case-of-emergency-contact space, I would repeatedly be writing me. One noon hour after lunch in a nearby fish place, we strolled over to the county courthouse, and there we filled out the application for a marriage license. The license was simply a permission slip, like a hunting license. It gave us 45 days to do the deed. In that time period, one could, quote, deer hunt, D-E-A-R, using the language of this state. That is what they called it there in the office. Um, although, also in the language of this state, what most hunters looked for, frankly, was a nice rack. <laughs> which, this is, why, this is why my agent didn't, which may have accounted for my new fiance's sudden clutching of his stomach. The clerk behind her desk raised her eyebrows, I'm feeling some horrible pain, said the masculine owner of this new license, looking faintly green. Seen it before, said the clerk, but not usually this fast. <laughs> this was all his idea, I said, or mostly. I think it was the fish, moaned you-know-who, whose name will say was Mike. I ate the same fish, I said. I feel fine. <laughs> you see, said the clerk. Mike was bent over in his chair clutching his stomach, but he did not excuse himself to go anywhere else. And so this is what makes marriage possible. No one actually getting up and running away. <laughs> Although a few unmarried weeks followed in which some discussion ensued, I don't really call, recall any of it. The next thing I do recall is getting up and dressing in an I'll be damned cream color suit, cream colored suit. We were on our way to the county courthouse to get married that morning with one friend and one clerk as witnesses, and then we would be getting on a plane, flying to Seattle, and renting a car so we could drive down the small Pacific Coast Highway to Los Angeles. This would be our honeymoon. Outside in the judge's office where we were to be married, a camera crew had assembled, all sitting wearily on the corridor floor with their equipment, they were from 60 Minutes and were apparently waiting for us. I didn't know your short stories were that well known, exclaimed Mike, <laughs> looking proud and amazed. 
Yes, well, I said, not wanting to disappoint him so soon. Who could these people, what could these people want? We were, we were here earlier in the week to do a story on the governor's Wedfair program, they announced. Those of you with some familiarity with Wisconsin may remember that. Um, but we left without getting footage of an actual welfare couple getting married. <laughs> we just need some footage, so we had to fly back last night. We heard a marriage was scheduled for this morning. Us, I asked, but we're not on welfare. That part doesn't matter. No one will know that. We just have to film two people getting married in this building. This particular parsing of reality troubled me. If they were going to pretend any couple was a welfare couple marrying to increase state benefits to themselves, as per the governor's murky thinking on the matter, thinking that briefly went national, why not also save on airfare and pretend any building was this building? <laughs> it was a generic municipal building for 10 seconds of footage. They didn't need this one. If something was already half a lie, then it was really a whole lie, so make it a whole one. The crew looked bleary, as if having just concluded a blistering gig with National Geographic. My new soon-to-be husband's <coughs> face brightened. We'd get to be on TV, he said to me, <laughs> clearly game for this. <laughs> that he was capable of being game for most anything, I realized, was the reason we were getting married <laughs> and the reason we would be divorced 10 years later. <laughs> but it could not be a reason for our being on 60 Minutes as an ersatz welfare couple. God, no, I said. The crew looked devastated. The judge's clerk shrugged, and my husband-to-be then tried this angle. It would be funny. It could be, said the head of the crew, hopefully. Although Mike would have donned a big rubber suit to play a betrothing walrus on Wild Kingdom because it would be funny, I could not participate. It would be bad luck, I said. No. Really? Really. She says no, said Mike. She says no, said the clerk to the camera crew who sat there grumbling and tired. The bride says no, said the judge himself, standing in the doorway. <laughs> and that is how my marriage began. <laughs> The signing of papers and saying of vows was very officey and took place under bright lights with no big city. A sweet little orchid was placed into my hand by someone. A picture I still have shows me with my hair clipped up, a way I, I almost never wore it unless cleaning something. <laughs> Soon we were on a plane where we were very quiet, not knowing what precisely we had done. We stared out different windows and took our respective naps, awaking to the same new fact of our lives. I thought of the James Taylor song, There We Are. Here we are like children forever, taking care of one another. I had just gotten married with no music at all. I then thought of the Dorothy Parker story, Here We Are. So how does it feel to be an old married lady, says the brand new husband in that story. Oh, it's too soon to ask me that, says his new bride. Well, I mean, goodness, we've only been married about three hours, haven't we? And here, the husband studies his wristwatch as if he were just acquiring the knack of reading time. We have been married exactly two hours and 26 minutes, he announces. My, she says, it seems like longer. <laughs> When we landed at the Seattle airport, the first thing I noticed were the signs and public address system announcements in Japanese, which seemed to me, to me another clue that marriage might involve a language I didn't actually speak. I sort of noticed my new husband looking around at all the blondes. Wisconsin had been very blonde, but was less so now, and perhaps Seattle seemed a blast from the Scandinavian American past. But that hankering outward was perhaps a necessary gesture, a final wave farewell to all the others. Why else do so many honey honeymooners head for beaches? We rented a car, stayed at a nice hotel, ate soft-shell crab, and phoned our parents. You eloped, exclaimed my mother, as if she were impressed. 
I guess we had a lope, though I, I didn't really understand that then. There'd been no ladder up to the window, no dashing off into the <laughs> night. I hadn't really thought deeply from the parental angle about our getting married this way, and now I regretted not having given it a longer, harder contemplation. I told my father about the 60 minutes thing, thinking he would find it amusing. You should have gone on TV, he said. <laughs> then at least I could have seen you since I didn't get a chance to give you away. He didn't sound angry or even all that sad, just sort of practical. But we would have been posing as a welfare couple, I said. I thought I'd been saving him money not having a real wedding. It might have helped the sales of your books, he said, in a, si a situation he always inquired about worriedly. We'll have a fancy party of some sort when we get back and invite everyone, I said. Which we did, during which my husband never put on shoes, just wandered around in his socks, drinking beer. That's in parentheses, I don't know. <laughs> this piece never got edited, so I don't know. Maybe the parentheses should be removed. The next morning we had breakfast, took some sarcastic photos of the bed, unmade and strewn with the morning's post-intelligencer. A, news, a newspaper whose very names seem hopelessly indicative of the occasion. <laughs> <laughs> and when we checked out, we bought the bathrobes as souvenirs. Good for giving away to goodwill a decade later. We rode some ferries on which I grew woozy, drove around the rainforest, which was a mossy, magical land containing every possible hue of green. Although it was a national forest, Japanese companies were already logging in it. We would hike and drive and stumble upon denuded patches full of sunlight and machinery and noise. Then we headed south, keeping the ocean, which we never got to see in Wisconsin, in sight on our right, visiting otters and seals and dune buggy gatherings along the Oregon beaches. We stayed at bed and breakfasts that were once churches, this to compensate for having married at the county courthouse, and in general tried not to quarrel. It was a road trip, and we had brought only two tapes. Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, <laughs> and another one called Jazz Wolf, which featured an actual howling wolf, accompanied <laughs> by some alternately plaintive and jaunty jazz. We drive along wordlessly, listening to the howling of that lonely wolf, its own brief history of time. The Stephen Hawking we could only understand for about five minute stretches, and then we'd have to rewind to listen to it over again. At this rate, the history of time would not only be far from brief, it would be a never-ending driving hazard. But I didn't want to proceed through the tape uncomprehendingly, so there was much rewinding, and then ultimately the frustrated substitution of Jazz Wolf. <laughs> oh, let's just put on Jazz Wolf. <laughs> Became a kind of refrain for our stupidity, something we carried on into the future with us into our marriage. Every marriage needs a refrain, and let's put on Jazz Wolf was ours. <laughs> We drove down the winding Highway 1, which vertiginously hugged the California coast, producing more wooziness in me, despite the great beauty of everything. Beauty, after a while, you just don't see anymore if you're immersed in it constantly. The worry of car sickness replaced it, and I didn't know whether we would be driving slower, should be driving slower or faster to get it all over with. Marriage. Following our guidebook, we drove through the giant redwood tree you can drive through. You've probably seen those pictures. Um, and in other parts of the woods, we got out. Our photo album shows me hugging the trees and my husband urinating near them, <laughs> which should tell you something, but I'm not sure what. In Mendocino, we stopped and had lunch and bought souvenirs, though the whole place seemed preserved in time in an artificial way. The charming pothead still roam the village streets while the actual makers of the gift shop ceramics remained hidden to avoid possible detection and derision. Crockery mockery, I said. Still, I thought I saw a whale, which is the kind of thing you hope for your first summer as a married woman. 
Eventually, after a cool, breezy day and night in San Francisco, the original shining city on a sea, where we lit a gas stove in our room and spoke incessantly of earthquakes, failing to leave our hearts or wear flowers in our hair, we turned inland and drove across the desert, which was eerily lunar day or night. Beneath the pitch-black sky, covering us like an iron skillet lid punctured by BBs, I swore I saw UFOs, perhaps near one of the several military sites sitting spookily out there in the sand. In the daytime, litter blew apocalyptically among the cactuses. My husband wanted to go to Las Vegas, and I kept making hooker jokes, which weren't really very funny. We passed signs for Death Valley, signs for the Funeral Mountains, signs for a town called Needles, and one sign that read Zizix Road, ZZYX Road, maybe some of you have been past that, which I think led to Needles, and we stopped so I could take a picture of that. Once we were in Las Vegas, in an absurdly cheap room, the city was not yet the opulent place it had become. It has become now. I remained upstairs reading while the mister went downstairs to gamble in the casino. No more hooker jokes. Let's get out of here, I said in the morning, and we drove the next day to Los Angeles and ate Italian-Greek fusion dishes with artichokes and goat cheese in them in a hip, bright place. It seemed the beginning of a kind of food I'd not experienced before, cooking that was over the top and unnecessarily delicious. We roamed the streets of West Hollywood and tanned our arms in the sun. And then we flew back home to the Midwest, to our little blue house where we'd lived for years and would live for a few more, and where our cat was waiting and happy to see us. The honeymoon was over, but that was okay. <laughs> the, the, kill, the kill fee was very good on that one. And the magazine completely went under, which is why I, I don't even remember the name of it. But has that ever happened to you guys? No? <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so I can, I can answer questions if you have any, if you want to know what happened to my ex-husband or anything like that. <laughs> um, he's doing fine. I can, I can answer any... No questions, okay. So you can just turn... Oh, oh the cat. The cat. We, you know, the cat died young. We, you know, the cat didn't live as long as our marriage did, so. Um, but the cat was originally mine. But my, but, but he, but they got along very well. Um, yeah. The cat was a great cat. I had these great tomcats for a number of years, and uh, he was one of them. So. <laughs> You guys are so sweet and quiet. And just... <laughs> oh. Good evening. Uh, I enjoyed your story, and having a little bit of familiarity with California and the West Coast, I was curious what made you get to a desert and how once you left San Francisco and went into Vegas and then came back out to Los Angeles when there's this gorgeous coastline between San Francisco and Los Angeles and Santa Barbara and so on. Well, you know what? We had lunch in Santa Barbara. I just left that out. Mm -hmm. And you um, found desert someplace between there and the Central Valley? I, apparently. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why this piece couldn't be published. Um, <clears throat> I may, maybe I have the geography wrong. Do I, I, we, we came... Yeah, we went. We but we went from Las Vegas to. Well, where do you, where do you where do you if you're if you're trying to get out to Las Vegas, where do you where do you? If you were going from San Francisco to Las Vegas, you'd probably have to cross the Central Valley, which is to say the coastal we went hills. Went through Bakersfield. Bakersfield is bottom end of the Central Valley. Oh yeah, we were there. And then there's some more hills between there and Los and Los Angeles. It, Oh yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm gonna have to check the geography. You're having too much fun being on a uh, honeymoon, maybe. It was the jazz wolf. It really. Oh, that's. <laughs> and the brief history of time that was our well concentration said. was, you know, elsewhere. But it's a terrific story. 
Well, th thank it's you. actually a personal essay. Mm -hmm. I have very few personal essays, but this is one of them. So thank you very much. Hello? Yes, hi. Hi. I'd like to ask you something about your voice. Uh, on the page, that is. Okay. Uh, I, I think you have one of the most recognizable voices in contemporary fiction. I feel like I could read a paragraph of yours anonymously and recognize you after a paragraph. Would you like to say something about how that voice came to be? I'm sure you didn't start that way. Um, I don't, I mean, I've heard people say that before. I don't really know what that means. I think that every piece I'm working on has its own voice, but of course I'm writing it, so it, the voice is coming from me. But I think of the voice as not belonging to me, but belonging to the story, or belonging to the narrative, to the novel. Um, and when you're writing in the first person point of view, it's a little different from writing in the third person. Um, but mostly, I'm think if I'm in the first person, I'm just thinking about the character who's telling the story and trying to get that voice right. If I'm in the third person, um, I'm usually tracking someone closely. Mm -hmm. But, but, the, but the, the voice is the voice of the story. When I first started writing, my, first, my very first book has no third person narratives in it. It's all second person, isn't it? Well, it's mostly first person, mm -hmm. but, but it ha it's half first person, half second yeah. person. And it was because I didn't know who was talking when I wrote in third person. I couldn't write more than a page in third person. I thought, well, who's saying this? The sky mm -hmm. was blue. Mm -hmm. who's, who's speaking right. this thing? Um, but eventually, the third person came to me, and then I and then I started writing all my stories in third person. But um, but you know that's just the that's just the journey of a writer. I I don't think that the first person and the third person sound the same. To, at least not to me. But I have to make sentences that are interesting to me and that communicate the story I'm trying to write. And I feel the voice belongs less to me, as I said, than to the to yes. the story. Yes, no, interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Laurie. Thank you for Hi. coming here. You are one of my favorite no, writers. Thank you for coming. Um, I wanted to ask you a specific question about your short story, How to Be Another Woman, which is a story that completely unprompted I still think about. Uh, uh -huh. Just think about it and uh -huh. um, recall how magnificent it is. Um, you write it in a sort of like an instruction, or, or like in a sec in the second person. Um, can you? My my question is, when you started out writing that story, was your intention already to be to write it in that specific form, or did it start out in like a more conventional, uh, with a more conventional structure? Um. That that is from my first book, which I was just mentioning, which is half in second person and half in first person. Mm -hmm. The very first story that I, well, the very first story I wrote for that book was in first person. But the very first story I wrote that was in second person, that mock imperative voice, was a story further in in the collection called oh, Just me. How. It's just, and I thought I would just write one story like this, and I'd call it How. And because I had seen that voice in poetry, and I thought you could tell a story in this voice. Now, some some prose writers had already been writing in the, in a version of that voice, but I hadn't seen it. Um, so I wrote the story called "How," which was a kind of how not to, you know, it was basically a breakup story, and I, it was meant to be a kind of sad love breakup story. Um, and then it would, the voice or the point of view, whatever you want to call it, cut a groove in my head, and I couldn't get out of it. And so then I was writing how to be another woman, how to become a writer, you know, I was writing how, 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 and then I wrote six of those, and then I was done. I have a kid's guide to divorce. I have a mall in the night visitors, a guide to the tenor of love. I loved 
every single pun I ever stumbled upon. Um, so there are about six stories. So, so it did, the story you mentioned, which is the very first story in that book, was very much, you know, but it was, it was a spillover from, from how. I couldn't get out of, of that voice. Now, how to be another woman, I didn't realize how shocking that story was. Because it's about a woman who's having an affair with a married man. And I'd read lots of stories about women who had done this. I didn't even know any married men at the time I wrote this, <laughs> except my dad. And, I, and he was totally shocked by this story. And I didn't realize t until later how shocking it was. But it was meant to sort of be a story about how when you're young, you do things and lose lose your way and lose yourself and become someone else. So again, in the title is the pun, how to be another woman, not yourself. And But after it came out, people called it how to be a mistress, how to be, you know, they started calling it all these things that it wasn't intended to to be or do, and then, you know, whatever. It's, a, it's kind of a shocking story, don't you think? Uh, my daughter yeah. wrote it, I'd be just so upset. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you've heard this a lot before, but I, I still think that it's probably one of the greatest short stories ever written. No, I never hear that, but thank you. <laughs> it is. It, it really is. I like re read it every now and then. Well, thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. 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 I remember when um, Birds of America came out, uh -huh. and I remember reading the review by Julian Barnes in the New York Review, and I, I still remember the review. I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful, supportive, exciting review. I was wondering what you thought of it, <laughs> if you had read it, and if it had any impact um, just on your career. I have no, I have no idea. Um... That book, that book got several very nice reviews. Um, it got a nice one in the New York Times book review, a nice one from Julian in the New York Review. Um, that was all, it was all, you know, at that time, I had a four-year-old kid at home. You know, it, it, life was busy. And so have, and I lived in Wisconsin and, and things, I don't know, I didn't quite understand what was happening with that book. And I don't think my publisher did either because at Christmas time, <coughs> there were none available anywhere. So they hadn't printed enough. And then they printed a whole bunch in February, <laughs> <laughs> which were scrapped, I think. But, um, but that, that book was, that book was, well, well reviewed, and I was grateful to everyone who sort of understood it and said generous things about it. So, thank you. Hi. Uh, there is a Clarice Lispector, mm -hmm. the Brazilian writer, mm -hmm. short story dealing with a uh, bug that's on a wall. Mm -hmm. And the uh, narrator, the whole story is dealing with the impact of mm -hmm. this bug on the wall by the narrator. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I only say that as introduction to the essay that you wrote on Cl Clarice Lispector. And why are you fascinated by her and has she done anything to influence your own writing? Oh, I think I was assigned that. I'm not sure that I... I sought it out because I didn't I didn't think I was I was equipped, you know, to to pronounce upon her. But I've also felt like no one in the US had heard much of her. Like, you know, I would consult with my colleagues and they were like, Clarice Lispector, isn't she a detective writer? You know, I mean people didn't know her work. And so I thought, well, I can, I can do this then. And so I read a lot of it. Some of it was badly translated. Some of it was not. Um, and then, of course, there was the Benjamin Moser biography. But the, she had, she has, a, Lispector loved to do these kind of things with animals. She would get her characters into these sort of psychological battles with animals. And then she would kind of... She was kind of a philosopher. I mean, she was treated as a philosopher by many Brazilians rather than a fiction writer. 
and by and by Europeans as well. Um, but she was an interesting writer, but I, I came to her far too late for her to have been an influence. Also, I think you have to read her in Portuguese to have it be a true influence. And apparently, the kind of Portuguese that she wrote in was unlike any other kind of Portuguese, that she was really doing things with the language that some people loved and some people did not. Um, so she didn't have an influence. I, I think reading about her life in that biography, in that Moser biography, I, I read the biography, then I read um, a, a novel or two and some stories of hers. Um, but the biography it was very interesting to me because she was the wife of a diplomat. And I thought, what a great life for a writer. Wouldn't that be great? You travel around with your husband and um, you live in different places. She lived in Italy after the war. She lived in Switzerland. She lived, she lived all over. She lived in, the, in, she lived in D.C. for a while. Um, but apparently she was miserable. Um, and I guess it's not a good life. I don't think Mary McCarthy liked it either. She was also married to a diplomat. I think that was her third husband. Um, but it always, it always sounds good to me, right? Here you are in DC, if you're a writer, marry a diplomat, follow them around. You get to live in places. I guess you have to throw a lot of parties and you have to be nice to people. <laughs> and that, I don't think Le Spectre liked that. She didn't want to have to be nice to people. Thank you. <laughs> I um, want to, don't want to beat a dead horse, but I want to bring up the question of how to be another one again because um, I love that story too, and wow. I feel like it's one of the stories that, like, yeah, you know, when I want to read another warm short story that like I've loved for years, I pull it out, you know, pull it out of the shelf and, and read it again. And you were talking about voice a minute ago, and I'm mm -hmm. thinking, you know, I'm not a woman, I was never another woman, and yet I know what it feels like to be another woman when I read that story. What do you think accounts for the success and the magic that you have in there of the voice, in the whole collection actually, in self-help, and all your, all your short stories, where the voice is so authentic that anybody reads it and feels like I'm living with this character's living and it rings true for me, even, you know, even if I'm not the character you're describing? Well, you know what? I was not any of those characters. That is probably the least autobiographical book, my very first book. So I had to imagine my way into those situations and those characters by probably drawing from some analogous things that I felt so I could feel some emotions that perhaps a, a person in that situation would feel. For instance, um, how to be another woman, the feelings I was giving that character came from, <laughs> came from the fact that my boyfriend was playing too much tennis with his ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and I felt like he wasn't mine, that he belonged to someone else. And so I brought all those feelings to this situation and created this, um, a character who had an office job and felt like a mediocrity and wore her Phi Beta Kappa key on her. You know, I, 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 I do know, I did know what it was to work in an office then feel like this was not a good job, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so I combined a lot of different feelings. But if, you're, if, you, if you force yourself to imagine something anew on the page, you're not transcribing, you're, you're having to imagine it and invent it, then the reader, w the reader has to step into it too, with you. Um, and I took nothing about those situations for, gran for granted because I was inventing them. Now, I wasn't inventing all the feelings, but I was taking the feelings and devising new, new circumstances for them so they contain those feelings. And, and with luck, you can feel the feelings. Yeah. You know what it's like to have your boyfriend play tennis with his ex. So, <laughs> you know, it's not good. It's not good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, a lot of people mentioned your voice in your writing. I actually first got acquainted um, 
with you through your voice, your actual voice on a New Yorker Fiction podcast. Oh. Um, and I thought, and I almost listened to all of the episodes, and I thought you were probably my favorite reader. Uh, and uh, so. I don't sound like I've been hit over the head with a baseball bat. That's what it sounds <laughs> no, like to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> At least not to me. Um, and uh, I was wondering uh, if you had any contemporary authors that you continue to read and uh, who inspire you these days um, because oh. I know that those podcasts uh, focus on the New Yorker archives so right. those are right. older generation authors mostly so I was wondering if you had any contemporaries well I know I'm right now I'm finishing up Alex Chee's new book and he's com he's coming here it's a fantastic book yeah. isn't it I just love it so I would recommend that and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna screw up the title it's called how it's a book of essay. It's a book of personal essays about becoming a writer. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of um, building's roman, I guess you would say, a literary, you know, coming of age mm -hmm. um, narrative. If you put them all together, but it's about being gay, about, but it, all, all from a writer's perspective: how being gay, how being mixed race. Um, all fed in, how being from Maine even, all fed in to his his life as a writer. And, the, and it's called How to Write an Autobiographical Novel? Is that? I think that's it. Um, so I would recommend that, and he's coming, so you can Thank you very much. get it signed. Okay. I'm going to ask you one question about reading, since this book has a number of reviews in it. I gather from what you said yeah. before that most of the reviews are probably assigned. Is that true? Some are, some, most were, most probably were assigned, you know, I only agreed to do the things that I wanted to do, and so now I forgot, and then I ended up really intensely involved with what I was reading and what I was writing, so I've now forgotten which ones were assigned and which ones I asked for, but oh, I did ask for a couple. Oh, good. And my question is it's kind of obtuse. Maybe I was going to ask you how you read, or maybe that's too obtuse. Maybe what excites you when you read something, you personally? Well, I guess I'm. Uh, it depends why I'm reading. I might be looking for for company. I might be looking for a voice that is keeping me company. I might be looking for information, and I might be looking for transport. I might be looking to sort of just be somewhere else. Um, there are many different reasons why you read, or you might read because you love a particular writer and they have a new book out, or you might read because, you know, a friend has a book out and has asked you to read it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so there's just many different reasons, but it's, you know, it's, I don't think a writer necessarily reads any differently from any other kind of reader. I think they're looking for the same things. The only thing is that when writers read, at least this happens to me, and I assume it happens to most writers because writers' libraries are filled with books. When collectors go to look at them, the books are filled with notes because you get ideas for your own work as you're reading someone else's work. It just happens because you're always working on something, so then you're reading along, and you and your mind might wander, and it, and it skips off the page that you're reading into the page that you're writing or something, and you, so you end up taking a lot of notes while you while you read, and I think that's the only difference. Not that you deliberately read to sort of get ideas for your own work, and you're not stealing. It's weird. You're not taking. You just you're just while you're reading the reading process is inspiring you in some way or gives you a thought or a phrase or something that you want to include with what you're writing. I mean, the same thing can happen just walking down the street. You get ideas and, and then you have to write them down. Um, so that's, you know, so writers scribble, but they scribble in the books they're reading as yeah. well. So, so Fitzgerald's books were famous for that and most writers, I think, have that. In fact, a writer I know who recently had his personal library assessed, he had lots of signed copies, but he'd kept them very clean. Um, and the collector said, if you had only written in this, 
<laughs> it would be worth more. And he was quite surprised. But he's well known enough, so yes, it would be worth more. Yeah. Um, Great, thanks. Hi there. Hi. Um, thank you so much for reading that essay. I really loved it, and it's really funny. And I was thank wondering you. why you don't do more personal essays and nonfiction. I'm not well. I'm not really drawn to them, and when I when I have done them, they get killed. <laughs> no one, I don't. Um, also, I feel like I need my. I feel like it's just not my thing. And fiction, writing short stories is what I do, and I've made that my my um, my focus. And so I don't want to. I I, I want to take all my inspiration and put it in that direction where I get to invent. There is a way in which I mean, we just had someone at that mic saying, "How can you get from San Francisco into the desert?" See, that's why I have to write fiction, <laughs> because there I am trying to write nonfiction, and I'm getting the geography wrong. <laughs> so, um, but there is this way in which you know you have the habit of invention, and you get to say whatever you want when you're writing fiction, and you get to you can get to some deeper places, I think, when you're writing fiction because you because you are you have this amnesty of a fictional narrative, um, and you're less likely to be sued, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate. Uh, I would run out of material very, very quickly also if I were writing nonfiction. I just don't have the inclination or the nonfiction material, really, I don't think. I mean, I thought the, uh, the idea that the 60 Minutes camera crew was there on my wedding day was pretty funny. And I thought, I can write about this. No one will believe it, but, you know, it's true. It happened. Um, but I don't have a lot of things like that. <laughs> it's not that funny, but thank you. <laughs> um, can I also ask when you knew you wanted to be a writer, and can you talk a little bit more about your process? Like when you wake up in the morning, do you just write, 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 endless inspiration, or do you struggle like the rest of us? <laughs> oh, I just write, write, write. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I never, I never wanted to be a writer. I just wanted to be able to have the time to write these things that I was I found myself writing it was like having an unfortunate habit or something <laughs> um, and I never thought that I would make any money from it and I haven't so that's <laughs> good um, so I, I was doing it for the right reasons um, I didn't really know what being a writer meant so that wasn't really an ambition of mine but I would have these stories and I, I, I s sort of felt I knew what I was doing in creating them. Now, I wrote much more in my 20s and 30s and 40s than I've written in my 50s and 60s and 70s. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not, <laughs> se I'm not 70 yet. Um, but so you have energy when you're young and you should use it. And your brain fires up more when you're young. And you should take advantage of that. Because writers, I hate to say this, I, just, I said this recently at a uh, table where there were a bunch of writers and they got all <laughs> so depressed. <laughs> but I said, after the age of 80, nobody's writing anything anyone wants to read. <laughs> and one writer totally agreed with me. And she said, yeah, we've got, we've got. 19 more years, that's, that's what we have. Um, now, in other, in other arts, it's different. You can, painters paint for quite a long time. And you can, as a writer, I suppose you could be like Annie Dillard and switch to watercolors when you turn 75. Um, and Verdi wrote Atello, one of his great, great operas when he was 80. So, I mean, musicians, composers, painters, they keep going. But writers, it's a harder thing somehow. You're, I mean, all cylinders of your brain have to be firing. 
and it's not abstract the way painting can be and the way music can be. And you're not working with a librettist or a lyricist or, you know, you, it's just you're really on your own and having to do all the stuff of it. And so do it while you're young. But you've got lots of time. <laughs> but don't waste it. <laughs> Is it terrifying? No, it's not for you. It's, it's just terrifying for um, <laughs> some other people like me. Um, this is a question straight from Amateur Writer Land. How do you know when a story is finished? Um, do you know if a story is finished? That's the question. Story is never really finished. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's finished when this. It, it, you've put all the energy into it that you can, and it seems to also have completed its own energies and, and its narrative um, things are somehow completed. But you can go back and, and work on stories forever, so you decide, you know, to some extent you decide. You say, this is as, as good as it gets and I can't make it any better. Now, you can say that a lot, and every writer knows this feeling, like, oh, it's done. And then they wake up in the morning, and then they're tinkering with it again. They, now it's done. Oh, no, they're tinkering with it again. They send it out, you know, now it's done. They send it to an agent or an editor, and then they go, oh, no. I've got, and then they send a revised, they say, don't read the copy I just sent you. This is the new copy, and then, you know, there are a lot, that's... So you tinker, you tinker away. I've even ch made changes from hardcover to paperback in a, in a collection of stories and in a novel. I cross out words. I go into stores and I say, hand corrected by the author. I just <laughs> <laughs> fix things that I don't like anymore. So. That's somewhat, yeah, that's comforting. And I, I have a, another question that might or might not be answerable. Um, my favorite story of yours is, which is more than I can say about some people, um, which is also a road trip. It's a mother-daughter road yeah. trip. Yeah. What, I guess... Something I've never actually done, I have to tell you. Okay, yeah. I was going to say, how do you no. approach, how is that road trip, other than the obvious ways, different than writing about your perhaps impossible California yeah. desert southern california road well you trip. know that that's about a road trip in ireland mm -hmm. and i did take a road trip in ireland with with my husband i'm not sure whether we were married yet then i'm not sure i think we were um but in so i had the notes for all the places and the things we did but i thought I didn't want it to be a story about marriage, and I didn't want it to be a story about what we had done. I thought, what if a, what if a daughter had gone with her, took her mother on a trip like this? Something I would never do. Um, but I thought, so I, I, I just made up this mother and daughter, and I wanted, I, I felt sorry for them both. I felt sorry for the daughter, and I felt sorry for the mother, but I wanted... I wanted the difficult love between them to sort of emerge by the end of the story, and I hoped it did. Um, but I did take it, yeah. Thank you. Okay. And thank you for writing that story. Yeah. Oh, thank you for reading it. So. All right, I think we might be done. You can get out your cell phones and everything. <laughs> thank you so much, Lori. Thank you for coming.